vicinity and slip down to Walsh, Walsh Street in uh, South Arrow. Right, hold the sedan, not knowing what the radio is. October the 12th, 1988, is a standout date in the history of crime in Australia. On this day, a line is crossed. A criminal taboo is broken. Hot white, yeah, it's definitely stolen. Just have a look around, I'll get the red out and call it in. Two young constables are lured to Walsh Street, South Yarra in Melbourne, and they're executed. Senior Constable Tynan was hit in the head and Constable Eyre lasted in the back as he looked on from outside. Australians are repulsed by the callous murders and police anger is immediately directed against one of the nation's most ruthless criminal families. Drug dealers, rapists, armed robbers and murderers, all offspring of the notorious matriarch named Kath Pettingle. But I didn't think I was notorious. I didn't think that I was this matriarch. I didn't think I was anything like that. I didn't think I was as bad as they made it. her and her family. Can I tell you, the moment I first met Kath, I could not speak. My mouth was dry and I was petrified because I was in the presence of Kath Pettingill and, and it was frightening. Born in the Melbourne slums in the Great Depression in 1935, Kath is an unusual child who has fantasies about death and evil. Oh, she deduced from what she read in the Bible that Satan was more powerful than God, and she wanted children. And so she, rather than pray to God that she would have children, and this was when she was still quite young, I think um, probably about 11 or 12, she prayed to Satan that she would have 10 children. The first of her 10 children is Dennis, who will become one of Australia's worst criminals killing at least five people and possibly as many as 12. At the time of his birth, Kath is just 16 and incapable of caring for the baby. So Dennis and her next child, Peter, born about a year later, go to live with Kath's mother. The boys have a brutal upbringing with their grandmother and her boyfriend. They, they were bad drunkards and they used to drink red wine every night and uh, every second night uh, I'd get belted with a pot stick or something or Dennis would be belted, you know, and it was a really horrible uh, um, existence. The two boys are led to believe that Kath is their big sister who's left home with a small-time criminal named Billy. Billy was violent and bashed her, um, but she didn't mind that. She had a boyfriend who was very loving and bought her chocolates and flowers and she had to get rid of him because he was too kind to her. Kath's satanic prayers will be answered and she'll go on to have eight more children fathered by two different boyfriends. Of her ten children, five will become notorious criminals. Dennis, rapist, drug dealer and ruthless killer. Peter, violent armed robber and drug dealer. Victor, murderous gangster and accused cop killer. Jamie, armed robber, drug addict. And Trevor, violent drug dealer and accused cop killer. A daughter, Vicky, will give birth to Kath's first grandson, Jason who will also get sucked into his uncle's criminal lives. Kath's eldest son, Dennis Allen, grows into a vicious teenage street thug 
and at 18, he ends up in jail. Kath, now in her mid-30s, leaves her job as a barmaid and becomes a prostitute. If she could earn in one night as a prostitute, what it would take weeks and weeks to earn behind the bar. So from a purely financial point of view, um, it was very much more attractive. But Kathy being Kathy, she didn't um, remain as just a prostitute for very long. She very yeah, Charlie, rapidly yeah. moved up the uh, ladder to become a madam. Charlie, come on! To this day, at yeah. least one of her criminal children is unaware his mother was a prostitute. And, and uh, uh, a bottom, but she, she didn't move them, the mine on She certainly didn't hide the money she was making from the profession because the boys used to queue up asking for bail money for their mates. By this time, Dennis and Peter have both left home, but they maintain contact with their younger half-brothers, often standing up for them against the discipline that's now being meted out by Kath's new husband, Jimmy Pettingill. I, I was about four, 15, 16, you know what I mean? And, and I did say to him, he, he kept asking me, brothers, we're going to do something with that. Anyway, not long after that, he, uh, he um, killed himself in that way. When Dennis gets out of jail, he gets drunk with his brother, Peter, and two mates, and they imprison and rape two girls in a flat in suburban Sandringham. The gang then splits up. Peter and a mate embark on a two-day, violent, drunken rampage. Oh, no, I just know we were flying. You now, if you're flying, you're flying. Simple as that. In a random attack, Peter and his mate shoot at a passing motorist, and Peter then shoots a pizza parlor owner in the foot. Yeah, his bike got shot in the foot there. And one of my friends was uh, grabbed some food off a plate and he started blowing. I gave him a hot pit. In suburban Port Melbourne, Peter shoots and wounds another man. Well, in Port Melbourne, a bloke pushed uh, Alan Bell, so I shot him in the face. You know what I mean? Next, Peter and his mate gate crash a party. They're quickly thrown out. But as they leave, a man is badly wounded when he's shot in the back. Oh, he told us to get going. So, uh, anyway, as my coach, she said in the statement, gun went off accidentally, and he got shot. All four men are caught. For the rape and shootings, Peter Allen gets 14 years jail. His brother, Dennis Allen, gets 10 for rape, although he only serves five. And their mother's world also becomes more violent. Kath is shot in the eye during an argument with two prostitutes. Yeah, I've been shot. Doesn't hurt. You go into a shock as soon as you're shot. Kath's attackers are tried for murder, but she remains loyal to the criminal code of silence, which allows them to be acquitted. <laughs> In 1982, Kath is running an illegal okay, brothel so in Stevenson I'll Street, Richmond, and next door, her eldest son, Dennis Allen, establishes the headquarters of a violent crime empire. It was a pretty complex place. Uh, you had Kath living in one house in Stevenson Street and Dennis next door. Uh, they had a kind of a communication system. Kath would scream out uh, uh, whatever she wanted and call for Dennis and uh, Dennis would then appear from the shadows, always looking pretty dishevelled. Uh, covered in tattoos, uh, adorned with uh, all sorts of jewellery, particularly heavy gold chains around his, his neck. Throughout these next bloody years, Kath and Dennis will maintain an intense relationship, more brother and sister than mother and offspring, the whorehouse madam and the killer son. I wouldn't think that Kath Pettingill knew everything on a day-to-day -day basis, but she'd certainly become aware of it and where she could, she would assist, and whether that was concealing things or making sure police were confused or distracted from what they're doing, she would certainly play that role. Together, 
they begin to buy up houses in Stevenson Street and adjoining streets and gradually build a solid compound that helps them avoid police raids. Across the back of that was the railway line, the main railway line into the city. And of course he had access, they'd go and hide things up on the railway line in the ballast between the sleepers and uh, that type of thing. So they exploited their environment. There was actually a hole cut out between the two premises through the wall and the drug dealing would occur in the brothel, uh, but the drugs would be handed in from the next door premises. They were the number one crims in Richmond and Richmond was well known because of that family. Um, and they were in full swing. You know, they owned 40 properties, they were untouchable. Dennis surrounds himself with henchmen he refers to as soldiers. And he also entices a few local identities into his entourage. And he put some white powder, took it off his pen knife in a plastic bag, put the white powder in my drink. And half an hour later, my nose dried up, I felt I had a burst of energy, so I thought, if I take twice as much, I feel twice as good. And it wasn't long after that, probably a month, six weeks later, he, he, he injected him in, in my arm. But he made sure that Kath was there to, to keep an eye on, you know, what comes in and what goes out. You know, they'd have a, like a fishbowl full of foils. Kath used to mark the foils with a green text of colour or a red one. Green is for go, speed, up. Red is for stop, slow, heroin. Dennis fortified the premises. They would have grills and iron gates and that type of thing on their premises, on their windows. Uh, he'd have safes, he'd have hidey holes everywhere. He'd always have uh, any amount of uh, weapons at his uh, easy disposal. Like he'd have swords hanging on the wall and knives of all sorts of varieties. There was a samurai sword, if I remember, uh, on the mantelpiece. And uh, I did on one occasion see a gun in the house, but I. Uh, made it clear that it wasn't appropriate for me to be even cognizant of anything of that sort. Kath's grandson Jason, by now a young teenager, comes to live with Dennis Allen as one of his soldiers. I know you're thinking. But not everyone enters Dennis's world voluntarily. Uh, there were times when he kidnapped women, uh, multiples of women. Jenny McMahon is 19 and has a promising modelling career when a friend introduces her to Dennis. We went around to his house. He kept spiking their drinks and everything. And he stopped me and I said, what? And he said, you're not going anywhere. And I said, I have to go home. He said, no, you're not. He likes what he sees and decides to keep her captive. Well, that night, he actually, yeah, raped me, sodomised me, um, and also he bashed me. What's that look for, bitch? Dennis, I did nothing. Bullshit. I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking anything. Who told you you could talk? He was the first one to put a needle in my arm, and I was, oh my God, what is this? You don't talk until I tell you to talk. Oh, speed, he was put, pumping it into me. You don't move until I tell you you can move. You don't do bloody anything until I tell you. Do you understand? He wanted people all the time around him to cover him, to do this, and he had his minders and everything. When Dennis goes out, he appoints Kath's teenage grandson, Jason, to guard Jenny. This bitch moves. No worries. I'll make sure the bitch don't move. Like he had a gun on me and a knife on me. If Dennis went out, he was the boss of me. I'm watching you. One day, the door was open, unlocked, and I ran for it and I got to the road in Richmond and there was three guns at my head. I pulled the taxi over and he saw the guns and he wasn't going to stop and got big, big trouble for that. Chained up and my head in a bucket of water. I am so lucky because every other girl he went out with is dead. I'm the survivor and I can't believe it. Who are you 
Kath Pettingle's eldest son, Dennis Allen, has set up a criminal empire next to her brothel in the inner Melbourne suburb of Richmond. You can't get me, you bastard! By now, he's staying awake for up to 14 days, living in a perpetual state of speed fueled rage. Jenny McMahon, who's his prisoner and who later gives birth to his child, remembers the madness. He made me stay up. 13 days and 13 nights, and I was going crazy, because I, speed, oh. One night, a police helicopter is hovering over the street when Dennis begins firing at it. It was like a bloody big game with the police. They'd come round the next morning after Dennis was asleep and say, will you tell him you stop shooting at us? Uh, he was a very clever criminal as far as concealing weapons. He'd conceal them over the fence with a string on them from next door. He was aware of the, the law of possession and if it wasn't on your property, you weren't in possession. Now, given an idea of her, of Kath Pettingill thinking, uh, young Jason Ryan, who was only a kid in those days, on one occasion when we searched the premises, we found a pen pistol under his pillow. And again, this is, was part of their ploy. If you hide it in the child's room, well, who's going to be charged? I'm not living in that room, I'm not in possession of the firearm, therefore I can't be convicted of it. And we said to her, well, who's going to wear this? Kath, uh, he's only a lad, only a boy. He's old enough. That was the answer. He's old enough. Despite police raids, it seems to Dennis that he's immune from arrest. And he lived in an, in an era that cops could not be trusted. You know, in the, the late 70s, early 80s, that no informer, no, no drug addict would come forward safe in the knowledge they'd be protected to give evidence against the likes of Dennis. His violent reputation leads the Melbourne underworld to give Dennis the nickname Mr D, meaning Mr Death. You know, after the Mr T saga on TV, and that's how he saw himself. He openly wore large gold necklaces, uh, numerous of them, uh, watches, diamonds. Uh, it was just a complete exhibition, basically. At one stage there, he bought some, some pretty good heroin. He knew it was good heroin, and uh, he told his crew to, to, to cut it accordingly, and they didn't cut it enough. And suddenly, there was five people found dead in the vicinity of his home, in Stevenson Street. And he, he went, I remember he went down and slapped one of the blokes that was selling it, and, he said, you've even killed my hairdresser. I'm supposed to get my hair cut tomorrow or the next day. Kath adapts to this violent world as Dennis teaches her how to revive victims of overdoses by injecting their jugular veins with alcohol and speed. The house of horrors. Yeah. A few people got murdered there, you know. Dennis was a, a fairly good person, a serious person. And he was a genius at working out who was talking shit, who was serious, and who wasn't. Dennis was a person who, if he's going to knock you, he'd knock you. There was never any caution with him. He threw all caution to the wind, and uh, if there's an argument, he just pull a gun out and shoot somebody. And that was acceptable to him and the family. With his continuous drug abuse causing severe psychosis and paranoia, Dennis suddenly decides that one of his friends, Wayne Stanhope, can't be trusted. Wayne Stanhope uh, was a spy for a pack of uh, some other crims. He was sent down there just to uh, see what's going on. And, uh, of course, Dennis already knew that. Cheers. During a party at home, Dennis casually asks Stanhope to put on a record. Make up with that song again, would you? Sure. He actually said, can you go and put the, your song back on, you know? And he walked to the stereo. Dennis went, bang. Hello, Dennis! And I went, oh my God! Dennis! Jason! 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 Jason!
Jackson! Jackson! Speed and adrenaline are now pumping through the drug lord's veins. Jackson! Wait me, little order! In a blind rage and refusing to believe that Stanhope is dead, he then takes a gun from his young nephew, Jason. Jason came out with the other gun and he saw it. Dennis emptied the whole gun as well and he, poor Jason, 13, he went spewed up and he was that sick. That'll happen to you if you don't keep your mouth shut. All right, all right, all right. We'll keep our mouth shut, yeah? Give me the knife when I said this dog's dead. And then the rotten bastard pulled him on the tiles and slid his throat as well. Don't you sit here? Clear this place up! All trace of killing is removed and the body is never found. And they all burnt their clothes and everything and I, I was told to burn my clothes and... Kath's pitiless nature is clearly exposed by her bitter complaints that Dennis has ruined her vacuum cleaner by using it to clean up blood and parts of Stanhope's brain. And I said, Kathy, your eldest son has just put 12 bullets in somebody's head on the sitting room floor in front of a room full of guests and you're concerned about your vacuum cleaner. And she looked at me and she said, Adrian, there are things about me you don't know and there's a side to me you haven't seen, and I don't particularly want you to see it. Dennis was a product of uh, the environment. He was a serious person. At that point in time, uh, if you're not going to listen, I got one in He was one of them people that, uh, you know, you could talk to him and it wouldn't penetrate because uh, you were talking shit. And uh, if they annoyed him, he would turn the radio up and put them off get rid of the body. No, no other discussions had ended into it. Dennis is out of control. It won't be long before Dennis's young brothers begin to enter their own violent criminal careers. Kat Pettingill's eldest son, Dennis, is now perpetually high on his own product. In a frenzied state, he murders a mate in front of a room full of people. Just speed got him. Injecting himself every few minutes with speed. Oh my God, Dennis! Because he didn't know who I was in his amphetamine. I'd have to say to him, Dennis, it's me, I'm your mother because he'd chase me in next door with the gun. I'd have to say, stop, it's me, because then he sort of pulled back and he knew that he was wrong. But it could have been me any time. Don't you sit here? Clear this place up! The madness continues when Dennis, with a cord hanging permanently on his arm, ready for his next injection, orders the killing of a drug supplier. This is closely followed by another pointless murder. When prostitute and heroin addict Helga Wagnig suffers a heroin overdose and is near to death in Kath's brothel, Dennis decides to finish her off. I'll fix her. You're right. Jason! Jason! What are you doing? He sends his nephew Jason, Kath's grandson, to collect a bucket of river water. Give me the bucket. Which he pours down Helga's throat before holding her head in the bucket until she drowns. Stop moving your feet! Stop it! Stop it! <laughs> The body is found in the river and a coroner's inquest is ordered. It's at this point that Dennis recruits his younger brother Jamie into his criminal empire. Jamie has been a violent criminal from an early age. He was an armed robber. 
it was Robin Hood told them and he shot a barman. And the barman died, unfortunately, and they charged him with murder, he was acquitted. Yeah, but done. Uh, yeah, he was a good kid. On the day of the coroner's inquest, Dennis sends his younger brother, Jamie, to deliver a violent gesture of defiance. If you then look at the contempt that they held the system in, they went and blew the coroner's court up on the morning of the inquest with a drum of petrol and a couple of sticks of jellic night. The small bomb was detonated only hours before the inquest into the death of 30-year-old prostitute Helga Wagner was due to begin. A few days after Jamie delivers the bomb, he's found dead killed by a massive heroin overdose. Jamie, again, was a very, he was a hothead, very ruthless, very violent, um, died of a drug overdose, and was probably a great outcome for everybody. Um, very unpredictable. Uh, and he was, a, he was a bit of a problem to the family because he was like that. I mean, he'd do things like, someone to look at the wrong way, and he'd be traffic something, he'd be just likely to get out and belt somebody. Although he was well known as an addict, Kath, who never finds fault in her children, insists he's been murdered with what's called a heroin hotshot. Delusion runs deep in Kath's family, especially in Dennis, who by this time thinks he's all-powerful and untouchable. His next murder is even more audacious. The victim is a Hell's Angel bikey named Anton Kenny, who was again lured into Dennis's house. There was a party, it was Dennis's birthday party, and uh, he was uh, accused of doing something, and um, Dennis took appropriate action, what Dennis thought was uh, appropriate. But it'll be on his terms, be on his terms, you know. G'day, mate, arm in, have a drink, you know, have a couple of drinks, do you want to try a bit of speed or something, you know? Get him in a lot of relaxed atmosphere, then, then kill him. You dog! Anton Kenny is shot three times. His body is then moved to another of Dennis's houses in Richmond to be prepared for disposal. With the windows boarded up, plastic sheeting on the floor, and a 44-gallon drum at the ready, the scene is set for a terrible blood-soaked event. Chopped him up and he said, I couldn't get his bloody legs in the barrel. I had to go back and chop them up too, just shove them in there, you know, and then they get the lid on the barrel. When Dennis sawed off the leg because it wouldn't fit in the 40 gallon drum, Kathy said very casually to me, You need to fucking bother. Uh, Regular mortis only lasts so long, after a while it goes off. The gruesome job completed. The drum is topped up with acid, lime and cement before it's sealed and dumped in the Yarra River. And when they rolled the, the, the barrel into the Yarra, it wouldn't go out far enough, so it sort of stuck out the water. And... Police find out about the killing and are about to charge Dennis with murder. He immediately seeks a deal and names a convicted murderer, Peter Robinson, as the killer. Well, as... Uh, I indicated at the time to them that more than likely Robinson probably helped dispose of the body but was unlikely to be the murderer, that Dennis was more likely to be the murderer and I think his history has borne that out. But he did get his freedom on the basis of trading out on that. Uh, and as it eventually turned out, he was responsible for the murder. Dennis escapes prosecution for the Kenny murder, but his crimes finally catch up with him anyway. Witnesses to another killing agree to testify against him and he's finally arrested and handed his first murder charge. But it comes too late. Dennis dies in 1987, his body weakened by years of drug abuse. See, that's the life he chose. Well, tough job, he done it. I think Dennis's whole situation over the last couple of weeks showed a lot of uh, regret. Uh, there was none of the bravado left uh, as his physical powers faded away. I think uh, I could see in his whole uh, posture a sense of uh, regret and sadness about uh, the nature of his life. Not a lot of that was articulated, uh, but it was written all over him. Dennis is certainly responsible for 
at least 12 murders where he's been implicated in the death of these people and disposal of their bodies. After his death, it emerges that Dennis has been feeding information to the police. Dennis Allen was providing information to the homicide squad, you know, which it turned out he was actually killing the people and then providing information where the bodies could be found, saying other people had killed them. The homicide squad said, don't you think it's about time? You tell us where all the bodies are so that we can let the family bury them. Kath Pettingle's life is now about to enter a new era in which two of her younger offspring, Victor and Trevor, will be accused of a most brutish crime, a wicked outrage that to this day still angers and upsets the people of Melbourne. The Walsh Street Murders. The death of Kath Pettingle's eldest son, Dennis, brings his murderous drug empire to an end. Throughout the years of Dennis Allen's criminal reign, his full brother, Peter, is in and out of prison for drug and armed robbery offences. And while he's inside, Peter is part of a sophisticated drug ring. We had corrupt prison officers bringing the drugs in and uh, we distribute them, put the money in them. The money would go on the TAB accounts and uh, the families were helped. The profits. Peter was a heavy user of methamphetamine, uh, probably more organised criminal than, than Dennis, I would say. Um, a lot of rat cunning. Uh, he had a, an extremely... Uh, his, his biggest uh, fault and one that was easily exploited was his ego. He had a huge ego. He was untouchable. He could do what he liked. With Dennis dead and his brother Peter back in jail for another long stretch, two of Kath's younger sons, Victor and Trevor, now move to centre stage. Victor Pearce was, uh, was not a, a, a madman like um, Dennis Allen. Um, Victor Pearce was a far more cold and calculating um, person. He was dangerous. Victor Pearce would be a more um, planned killer. Um, so if he was going to do something, he would plan to do it. All the things in, uh, that the community may find um, disgusting or, or th frightening or threatening um, was just a way of life for him. With Pierce also but he was accused of popping a few armed, armed bands in it. And I heard he, he was pretty good at it. Absolutely ruthless. He, he, was, he was a real deal. If you say that bloke has done the wrong thing, I'm going to knock him, he'd knock him. Simple as that. Victor was a person that I treated with a lot more respect than I had for Dennis or Peter. Um, I would consider him a lot more dangerous, a lot more ruthless um, and capable of anything. In 1987, members of an elusive armed hold-up gang known as the Flemington Crew are shot down in separate confrontations with police in Melbourne. Victor Pierce's best friend at the time is Graham Jensen, his accomplice in many armed robberies. On the 11th of October, a police trap's planned to apprehend Jensen and charge him with a murder. He spots the waiting police who call on him to surrender. He goes for his gun and he's then shot and killed. 33-year-old Graham Jensen, who was wanted for the murder of a security guard at a Brunswick supermarket in July, was shot dead by police at Narry Warren. And they'd been uh, involved in, in uh, surveillance and went out to do an arrest on him, and uh, which resulted in him being killed. On hearing the news of his friend's death, Victor Pierce flies into a rage, weeping and vowing revenge. Early the next morning, two police constables are patrolling on the night shift in South Yarra. They are constables Steve Tynan and Damien Eyre. It's just before 4 a.m. They answer a radio call to investigate an abandoned car in Walsh Street. They did what any other police would have done. They pulled up behind the vehicle, 
constable kind of went to the driver's side and it actually hopped in and was looking about how the vehicle had been started. It had a smash vent window and the ignition had been tampered with hot wire. While he's done that, Constable Lear's gone to the passenger side and he's actually written down the registration number and checked that yeah. against the registration label because he had the expiry date on his clipboard. Yeah, it's definitely stolen. Just have a look around, I'll get the rego and then we'll call it in. He then walked around to the driver's side and was leaning over the driver's side, obviously conversing with Constable Tynan when he's been approached from behind. Hey, uh, get the Give me the gun! He's then turned and obviously deflected the firearm. The gun's gone off again and hit a house on the first floor with a, with a round of SGs. Someone has then walked up and pulled his revolver out and shot him at point blank range um, in the vicinity of the bottom of the ear. And then when he's gone to the ground, he's been shot at a, about a 45 degree angle through the side, which went through his heart. Um, so, you know, like he was instantaneously dead with the shot to the heart and also the shot to the brain. Constable Tynan was shot directly uh, through the top of the head with a full load of SGs from a 12 round shotgun. There's no such thing as a minor injury to a shotgun. South Melbourne 150, I sent uh, France 311 down to Wall Street. Uh, since then I've had about three or four cars come down saying that they've heard shots fired in that street and I can't get France 311 at this stage. South Melbourne 350, two members down, urgent. About 4.20 in the morning I got a phone call from uh, John Noonan who was the senior sergeant in charge of the crew. He said I'll pick up in 20 minutes two of our uh, guys have been shot. Um, it was a very sobering uh, sight to walk down a street and see um, police uniforms just lying there in blood. Very emotional. I mean, I'll never forget going back to the office and you know, people were just in tears. You know, and um, you couldn't console them. You know. and, now to slaughter two two young fellows at 20 and 21 and the, you know that have now no longer got a life uh, and the effect that that's had on their families um, very few other crimes in my book would rate the level of callousness of that that action it was quite evident uh, in the early stages that it was um, a very callous and, uh, and calculated killing one motive was uh, its relationship to uh, to the graham jensen shooting the day before so it was always going to be a very difficult investigation and one that you're going to need extra resources. I hoped at that stage that it wasn't the Pierce Pettingill family because I knew it was going to be a hard road. The murders shocked Victoria. There was a massive public outcry over the murder of those two police. The uh, Guard of Honour at the funerals at the academy went for more than a kilometre. There was real emotion amongst the police and the broader community. Uh, some saw it as the murder of two police. Most saw it as an attack on the rule of law in Victoria. It was effectively an act of terrorism to randomly select two police. My first thought, another day in Melbourne. Senior police set in motion a major operation to track down the killers of police officers Tynan and Eyre. Across the state, grieving colleagues volunteer for extra duty. It wasn't just an offence against the police force, it was an offence against the public. It was a community offence, so the community were very, very supportive. The stolen car was left there. They didn't go after the people that they hated, which was the armed robbery squad, who they felt had wrongfully killed their mate, Graham Jensen, 13 hours earlier. They put a car there and they waited and they didn't care who turned up as long as they were wearing the Victoria Police uniform and then they shot them from behind. Put it down! Put it down! Give me the gun! Get the gun! Put it down! Get the gun! 
The investigation is named Thai Air and will become the largest ever conducted by the Victoria Police, lasting some 900 days. Killing police is a major criminal taboo, and the underworld is now prepared for a disruptive backlash. Fearful of being blamed for the outrage, many of the current escapees from the state's prisons turn themselves in. You know, we started out with, I think, something like 39 um, escapees across Australia. I think within two weeks, most of them given themselves up um, into police stations because they just didn't want to be part of it. But I thought, this is not too much for me. I'd rather go back and do my time. What a piece of shit you are! Detectives immediately suspect that Kath's clan is behind the murders. And on the day after the attack, dozens of officers descend on the house of Kath's son, Victor Pierce, in the Stevenson Street compound. It would take a particular type of criminal to commit that type of um, killing. Victor's home is demolished, the backyard dug up, and every particle examined for evidence. It's suggested to the investigators that if Victor was involved in the killings, then the key might be to question Kath's grandson, Jason. Uh, I'd retired by then, but the mail you get as things go along, uh, I rang the uh, hotline and I told them to pick up Jason. Uh, he was their only hope in that house. And um, I, I told them if they treated him properly, he'd most probably open up like a watermelon falling off a truck. The police advice proves to be solid. Jason has had enough of his violent world with Kath's sons. Jason agrees to testify against his uncles. Meanwhile, the war goes on. Police resume their operation against the armed robbers and two more are shot and killed. Both of them also happen to be prime suspects in the Walsh Street murders. The Thai Air investigation continues for more than two years before detectives finally make four arrests. Victor Pierce's name was linked with drug dealing. Victor Pierce, his half-brother Trevor Pettingill, and their associates Anthony Lee Farrell and Peter David McAvoy are charged with the Wall Street murders. They're immediately sent to Pentridge Prison's notoriously violent H Division. There was, it was a brutal place. Whenever a prisoner arrived there, there was a systematic bashing by the prison officers. The prisoner would be stripped naked, surrounded by several prison officers and belted for several minutes. Uh, and if he resisted, uh, the bashing would continue. The prosecution reveals that in addition to Jason, they have a new star witness. She gives police a detailed account of Victor's planning and the direction of the executions. But as the trial's about to get underway, she suddenly withdraws her testimony and the police case collapses. Jason's evidence alone is not enough to convince the jury and the four men are acquitted. As the news breaks, police across Victoria are sent a special radio message urging them to control their anger. Well, all they found was they're not guilty. They're certainly not saying they're innocent. They just, uh, they had a doubt. It's reasonable doubt. Inside the car, the scenes of jubilation continued. Good as gone. Good as gone. What about you, Kathy? You got your boy home? Oh, my age, I've got him home. Family's yeah. nearly all complete now. He feels sorry for the families of the two policemen killed. They've been deceived all this time that we are the uh, ones what done it when, in fact, we aren't. Pretty shocked. Pretty shocked. Do you expect that? Not really. No, no, no. not at all. 42-year-old was sitting in his parked car in the busy Bay Street shopping centre. Another vehicle pulled up alongside. Man got out and fired several shots. A few years after the acquittals, Victor Pierce is shot dead by a rival criminal, Andrew Benji Benjamin, who is himself then killed. I can never bring him back and... Yeah. Miss him heaps. Well, I'm glad Victor was died the way he did because he wasn't mutilated, he wasn't hurt. You know, he went quick.
Some years after the Wall Street acquittals, Trevor and Kath Pettingill get involved in a new drug dealing enterprise. But they're caught after undercover detective Lachlan McCulloch infiltrates Kath's family and narrowly avoids being murdered by a killer named Stacker. That he obtained the name because he stacked up dead bodies on his front doorstep after um, allegedly deliberately overdosing certain people. Detective McCulloch endured a dangerous nine months undercover inside Kath's family circle. And Stacker was, um, and, and Kath were, were planning to rob me at one stage because I was rocking up with very large amounts of cash. And Trevor actually protected me from Stacker and stopped him from, from cutting my throat. McCulloch's courage pays off and results in 15 people, including Kath and Trevor, being convicted. Trevor got seven with a minimum of five. Um, Stacker got five. Uh, one of the heroin suppliers got 11 years. You know, many of them got very good sentences. Kath received an 18-month sentence, which um, she'd already served, because um, the magistrate uh, made the comment that she was showing signs of rehabilitation. Kath retires to a quiet life in the Victorian seaside town of Venus Bay. Trevor lives nearby. Kath's other son, Peter, who has spent most of his adult life behind bars, has no contact with her. I have not got a relationship with Kath, Kath Pettingham, nor, nor do I need one, nor, nor do, I, do, do I want one, simple as that. No, I don't want him here, he doesn't know where I live, and, and if you try and find out where I live, you'll, I'll think that you'll get short shift down the shops, because they won't tell you. Leave me alone. Get on with your own life, leave me alone. I never really fought with her verbally or anything like that, but after Dennis died and uh, all his wealth got distributed amongst people other than his children, and they're living on the street. Kath is also estranged from her grandson Jason and her daughter Vicky, who remains under witness protection. <laughs> Kath has received a framed citation from the Victorian Premier for her voluntary work driving women to and from weekly bingo sessions. And it's just one reflection of the range of images she projects. Kath Pennigal is a, is, uh, is a, a woman that's, that's reared murdering, drug trafficking, um, lying, uh, perjuring, um, manipulators of, of, of community interest standards uh, over a long period of time. She saw herself as Mark Barker and, uh, you know, I'm the boss of the clan and, and she enjoyed it. I was just being me. Cathy can be a very warm, intensely loyal human being. Um, so it, it's wrong to write the whole family off as being unmitigatedly vicious and evil. She has ruled a, a clan of outlaws, and outlaws in the true sense, you know, they have lived their life without law. And, and she contributed by the fact of probably being the neglectful mother, and they could do what they could do, and she could say, see no wrong in them. And if the police turned up and said, well, your son's just raped somebody, she'd defend them to the death. She could have done more, and she would have liked to have been able to have uh, given them uh, a more uh, protected uh, life in their early years. That realisation dawned on her as she saw Dennis more and more out of control in his adult life. Uh, but you can't unwind history. We're talking about a woman who's, you know, lost two children to heroin overdoses, who's happy to traffic in heroin. With all the mixtures of drugs that are out now, no. I'd hate to be anywhere near them. I've told you before, Charlie, no. Come on, now, I've got to wake up. Dennis! Don't let him speak to me like that. A bit of respect around here, eh? The amount of people who have died at the hands of her family, through direct, uh, directly or indirectly, through their drug trafficking um, and, uh, and general 
criminal behaviour can never be underestimated. It, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of, of community lives have been wrecked in some way or impacted on in some way because of uh, the likes of Kath Pennigal and her family. And, and that should never be underestimated. A lot of those people don't get up after five years or two years or ten years and, uh, and go on with their life. They've, uh, they're dead or they've been impacted on where their lives have been forever changed for the worse. And that's not something that we forget. Until the day she dies, she should pay for what she has done to society. Yeah.